start us off with an easy one. Start us off with an easy one. I got you. Okay. How old are you guys? Well, a while ago I was 20. <laughs> and in the well, future I'll be 30. It's not polite to ask a lady her age. Yeah, he won't answer you anyways. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Matt Kimona asked us, why are you so awesome? Why is Matt so awesome? No, why are we? I think, why are we so awesome? We're not awesome. Why are you so awesome, Matt Kimono? Yeah, you're awesome, Matt Kimono. We're not. We're incredibly average. If you made a Q&A video, I would ask you that question. So there you go. We're not awesome. We're incredibly average. I'm not even supposed to be here. That's another story for another day. Maybe the next Q&A. It's hot and sticky out here. We're going to go inside for a little bit till it cools off. What's the next one? What's your favorite aircraft to fly on? Ooh. Well, we only fly on C-130s right now. Yeah. Hopefully I could fly on a P-51 one day. That would be really cool. So I guess for now, my favorite aircraft is a C-130? Yeah. It's also like asking what type of lottery do you enjoy winning? It's like <laughs> any, yes, all yes, of them. Yes, I'll fly on any airplane. <laughs> I, I like a lot of them. All right, give me another one. <sighs> What advice do you have for teenagers interested in starting their own woodworking business without any knowledge? What? I, we made a whole video on this. You we haven't did. seen it yet? If you haven't checked it out, check it out up there. We made an entire video, literally just tips for teens that want to start a business. So go watch it and then come back here so it boosts our ratings. <laughs> we got another one? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one. Have you ever thrown anything out of those airplanes you fly? LOL. Thrown? We drop uh... weather, small weather instruments, like especially in the storms, um, we'll, we'll drop them. They've got like a little parachute and they float down to the surface and it's just getting like temperature, wind speed, all that kind of data. And then um, we also work with the Navy on occasion and we'll drop larger buoys out of the back of the plane. And they're also just gather, like gathering ocean temperatures and all that sort of stuff. So not throw technically, but we do drop certain instruments. Whew, that fire is hot now. Very toasty. Okay, what's next? Okay, um, what is your five-year goal? Mm. So mm -hmm. we got an interesting take on that. We don't have five-year goals. We have 10-year goals. We have one-year like goals, one goals. And like six-month goals. Yeah. But five years, five years is far enough away that it's hard to see, but not far enough to like really make project something real big. progress. Yeah. Yeah. So at five, years, at five years, I hope I am like really working hard toward my 10 year goal. Right. What's the quote or whatever? Like everybody overestimates what they can do in one year, but underestimates like, what they can do in 10 years. Yeah. I feel like the five year goal sort of like straddles that. And anyway, we know that in five years we will be on our way to our 10 year goal. We just don't want to like, we don't want to force ourselves to make it look like something that it just might not be. Right. I mean, I'd like to be like, ha you know, have a few employees and the business is still going strong and- Right, um, we will probably be in our second or third commercial space by then. We hope to have at least a dozen employees for each mm -hmm. business. Carl Farrington asked us, will a new CNC be installed in your new HQ in your headquarters? Hi, Carl. What brands and size will you be looking into? Uh, the biggest one that we can afford. We have a plan for a CNC. Uh, it's just we needed the floor space for one that's big enough to do what we need it to do. Yes. So I, I do know. miss having a CNC, like, well, a working CNC. We miss being excited about CNCs. Because yeah. they're really cool. Yeah. But... It's just you got to spend enough money on one that it's yeah. not a toy. And if we're going to spend that much money on one, we need to buy the last one that we're going to use for a while. So short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, I don't know. <laughs> Observe the Bucky's wearing croc sporting male placing wood onto the fire. He has no idea that his crocs look simply ridiculous. And yet, there he is, outside of the house, still wearing them. He has been informed by the female species that his crocs are unacceptable to wear outside of the domicile. However, here he is, crocs and all, lighting his fire. Okay, next question. Who's asking? 
It matters. It matters? It matters. Who's asking? Alex Herod? Okay. Herod? What does Alex want to know? What is up with your obsession with Bucky's? I am from Texas and it's just a gas station with nice bathrooms. I don't get it. You can leave the state. <laughs> That's an option. You can do that. No, we just really like it because even before we lived in Texas, we would stop at Bucky's on road trips. And that was always like our little celebratory stop was Bucky's. Um, it really started as a joke. I mean, like I had a it used to be dark red shirt from Bucky's. It was now now it's pink. Yes. But I I don't know. I just got it at a gas station because you know Bucky's is just a thing here. I got it really just to say, you know check the box and say I went. It I fueled know. our excitement to move to Texas because we always Correct. knew like when we didn't know if we were going to get the jobs with the Hurricane Hunters or not. It was kind of like a, a dream. Like oh man, we could move to Texas. We could live in you know Texas and we'd have Bucky's. And so I don't know. It was just our little. Um, I don't know how to describe it on our roadmap of like what we wanted to do with our lives. Yeah, it, it really was wasn't, a reminder. It wasn't a thing until it became a thing. You know how that, yeah. like, I don't know. I just started buying more Bucky shirts every time I went to Bucky's. And then before you knew it, like everybody thought I was obsessed with Bucky's, which then fueled the obsession with Bucky's. So yeah. now we make Bucky charcuterie boards. Yeah. <laughs> Is the stud stack just for woodworking businesses or for all makers? Oh, what a great question. Stud stack is open for all makers. We've mm -hmm. got people in there that wrap cars. We've got people in there that build like, cutting boards, charcuterie boards, furniture, built-ins. Oh, uh, all cart. sorts of stuff. We, people who make signs, like not like yeah. wooden signs, but like- People that make puzzles and stuff for kids. Yes. And we got people that do websites. Like we got web yeah. designers in there. Web so. design, people who are way into photography, um, people that work more with like acrylic than they do wood. We take all kinds. Because honestly, a lot of the advice like works across the board. You know, the sales and marketing advice really covers yeah. multiple types of businesses. Yeah, if you sell physical objects and to a certain extent services, um, really everything that we cover in the stud stack is, is probably gonna apply. Yeah. So there's no commitment. Like you can just leave. If you get in there and you hate it, just leave. Like, right. it's no big deal. But we have got, I mean, all sorts and people whose part-time jobs are completely different than woodworking too. We've got, I mean, EMTs, well, that's, So IT that's where guys. it's really cool is we get all sorts of experiences of people's part-time jobs or their, their day jobs come in and they help and they say, hey, you guys ever thought about selling to this industry or stuff like that. So cool stuff. We got a teacher in there now. Yeah. He's selling all sorts of cool stuff to other teachers and principals and administrators. So that's a whole other world we can, you know, have, have a, a perspective. And that's what you're getting is the more different perspectives we have in the stud stack, the better it is for everybody. So we don't want just woodworkers in there. Right. We like, like we love woodworking and everything, but. So the answer is like, we want you, you are welcome. Even if you're not a woodworker, like, please, you are going to make this, this space like even better than it already is. Yep. So the question. The Bucky's thing came back up again, and the question was raised, how many Bucky shirts does Davis have? Well, I am pleased to inform you, Davis only has four Bucky shirts at the current moment. Jenny, on the other hand, has five, One, six. One. <laughs> two. <laughs> three. This is my newest one. Four. Um. Five, <laughs> six. So there you go. Jenny has more than me. It's just, I wear mine as shop shirts. I don't know, what do you do with yours? I don't know, I wear them like climbing or to the gym. I wear them in the shop sometimes. All right, we got another one. All right, Scott Michael asked, what will be your first- Michael Scott? No, Scott, Scott Michael. What will be your first tool slash equipment purchases for the new shop? Honestly, we've been slowly purchasing all of the equipment that we've known we've wanted in the commercial space, potentially a CNC, but I feel like the equipment we're gonna buy first is more like office, office equipment, right. we'll like have cubicles and desks and- Stuff like that. Yeah. As far as shop related purchases, one of the first things I wanna get is I wanna get a nice, somebody else asked something about a finishing room. Oh yeah. I wanna get a really big, I know they make them, I just don't know what they're called. Um, it's a big tent basically that you can like repaint a car. It's like a paint booth, mm -hmm. but it's like collapsible. It's made out of like ripstop nylon material and you can just like set it up and then collapse it when you don't need it. I wanna get one of those so we can have a dedicated spray finishing area where we don't have any overspray or anything like yeah. that. I want to get a really big panel rack. 
Yes. Um, like a big clamping system that we could have like, I forget what they're called, but they're like a big rotisserie. It's like, think of the doors from Monsters, Inc. Like, oh, yes. With all the doors like rotating around. It's like you can clamp 10 or 20 tabletops on this huge contraption that like cycles them around on a carousel. So we got to get one of those big panel of, or big clamp rack panel thing words and stuff. This looks like such a nice camera angle. Why don't we ever use this angle in our videos? I like specifically decorated so that we could have this camera angle. This is the camera angle I use in like TikToks and stuff. Oh, well, it looks nice. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> oh no, the fire's almost dead. Next question. What has been your biggest lesson learned from first to second business in the Houston area? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, the first business was a completely different kind of business. Yeah, that was more custom. How do I say this? The biggest lesson for us is to not limit yourself. Yes. Dream bigger. Dream, I, that's, that's really the big difference. The biggest lesson we've learned is start with what the customer wants. Yes. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not build what you want to build and then go try to sell it later. Because Start with what your customer base wants and they'll tell you what they want if you're talking to them and you're listening and mm -hmm. then develop a product, solve a, solve a problem. Okay. Like for us, like real estate is huge in Houston. This yes. is one of the real estate capitals of the world and a larger percentage of the population owns their home or land which means you got a high percentage of homeowners who want to fill their home with nice furniture. So that's why we sell cutting and charcuterie boards to real estate agents. It's a marketing technique. It's not really a product. And also once you build what people want, all of a sudden you're able to find so many more connections within the community because people want what you build and they know somebody else who wants what you build and you just have more opportunities to like collaborate with people and get into other people's industries. All right, Ostling's Lasercraft wants to know, is Jenny related to Jody Sweden? We get this all the time. People will say I look like Stephanie from Full House. I look like Jody Sweden. I don't know. I can kind of see it. Davis can kind of see it, but I think that's super funny. I grew up watching her on Full House all the time. Love her character, but no, I am not related to Jody Sweden. Okay, got another question. Um, what's more terrifying, flying into a hurricane or being on the verge of upscaling into an industrial workspace? I would say neither are terrifying. Yeah, not like terrifying. I'm more scared to drive on I-10 than I am either of those things. Oh my gosh, You yes. want to talk about like acceptable levels of risk? Driving is way more dangerous than just about anything that you do the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny when we hear comments about like safety or I don't know, just like risk management. It's very right. personal to everybody, but if you would realize just how dangerous some of the day-to-day -day things that you do are, you would never set foot outside your house. So anyway. It's developing your own level of risk management. Right. I feel much more comfortable in an airplane with a crew of five people that are extremely experienced, know what each other can do and can trust each other than I am riding in an Uber of somebody yeah, I've never seen I them drive before. It's, it's relative, I'd say. I mean, I'm a little nervous about getting an industrial workspace, but only because I've never had one before. I'm sure once I have one and you know, the jitters yeah, it's have not worn so much, off, yeah, it's it not won't so be much. bad. It's the unknown. I feel like everything's a little bit terrifying until you've done it the first time. Yep. Under the tree. Under the tree. Under the tree. Are we gonna get copyrighted for that? I hope not. This is a very uh, flattering angle. <laughs> okay, um, JP Bratt asked, where did you guys go to school? Well, I went to North Lamar High School in Paris, Texas. <laughs> but I'm guessing you mean college. Uh, yeah, I, I highly doubt they care about where we went to high school. This dog is really irritating. I uh, know, yeah, this poor dog back here is having a rough day. But uh, yeah, we went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Yes. In Prescott, Arizona. Basically a kind of nerdy engineering school but we enjoyed it. it was Honestly, a it was a great location and we went hiking pretty oh much gosh. every single weekend. So I would love to live there. I, my, one of my goals in life is to eventually have a place where I can live back in Arizona, whether it's a place where I live permanently, whether it's a place I Airbnb and I go live there maybe two months out of the year or whatever. I want to get back to having a home in Arizona because I love it so stinking much. Oh really? Um, really, do you? Yeah, just a wee bit. <laughs> Um, excuse me. 
This one's this one is definitely charcuterie boardable. Look at this. No, this is like a solid charcuterie board right here. Give me this. Well, there you go. For those of you that say we never do anything with our scrap, we're making a charcuterie board out of it. So I'll go ahead and answer a question that I know everybody watching this is asking is why don't you do stuff with your scraps? Uh, whether that's coasters or more cutting boards or whatever. I totally understand where you guys are coming from and I probably would have said the same thing a couple years ago. But those scraps are variable in size. It's just when you have a consistent product and you have a bunch of lumber that is not up to standards of what that product needs, you're wasting your time trying to make something out of the scraps. Your time is better spent throwing it out and making more of whatever product you are selling. Because even if you could make something just as fast, do you have a way to market and sell it? Uh, we hear ideas for coasters all the time. And that is a great idea of what you can do with scrap wood, but I'm not gonna spend three weeks looking for a market to sell tiny little coasters to when I could spend that time selling a $200 cutting board. We've only got so much time in the week and it's better spent selling a more expensive, higher margin product than it is trying to peddle coasters that nobody really wants to buy. What if you commit to a commercial space and then your job gets moved to another state? Our job is already in another state. Mm -hmm. The Hurricane Hunters are based out of Mississippi and we already travel there when we need to go work. So that's one of the reasons we chose that job is that we could work it part time remotely. That's why we left active duty military is because they choose where you live and there was no way that we could build and scale a business only living somewhere for two or three years. If you want to build and scale a business, spoiler alert, it's going to take 10 years. So that was one of the things that went into our decision to go part time was, yo, if we really want to build a business, we need to get out of the military f at least full time. Full time. Yeah. And get ourselves into a position where we can start to choose where we want to live and for how long. Next question is from Sergio Hernandez. And he said, do you see yourselves always being involved in the day to day production of your products? Would you be <laughs> happy with behind the scenes only positions in your company um, day by day? Yeah, please. Yeah, I cannot wait until I'm more behind the scenes um, in the production and I can start making like higher level decisions like about the marketing and all that sort of stuff. Yep. We are both terrible woodworkers. We are both terrible <laughs> salespeople. We are just average people. Like our, our skill set, what the Air Force has trained us to do is to be really good managers and supervisors. And that's what we want to do. We want to make big 30,000 foot decisions and support the people on the floor making right. this stuff. Like, I want to support the person who's fantastic at sales and has, you know, a huge new idea that they think is going to like revolutionize the way we do things. I want to like be able to sit down with that person and discuss what that plan looks like. But in order to do that, we have to own every part of our business before we're allowed to outsource it. You should look into a book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. We've got to own inside and outside every part of every job in our business before we can hand it off to somebody. Otherwise, we're setting them up for failure or we're setting ourselves up for failure because if somebody comes in and saves the day and then they move on to another company, now we're screwed. We don't know how that part of the business runs. Because we've never done it. Which is why you've seen us go so painstakingly slow and running this business is because we're, we're trying to learn these skills ourselves, write procedures, understand the ins and outs of we're all We're learning these jobs. sales and marketing and manufacturing and distribution and packaging and built like every aspect we are um, forcing ourselves to learn first. But anyway, to answer your question, yes, we would love to be behind the scenes. We can't wait until we're behind the scenes. Yes. But we got a lot of kitchen tables to make until yes, we're there. <laughs> we got a lot of work until we can like sink into the behind the scenes aspects. Bradley wants to know if, uh, are we looking to be the household name for cutting boards? No, we haven't even started. We got some big pickles. <laughs> I hope nobody takes that the wrong way. They probably will. Well, update on the fire. We were gonna have s'mores and continue the Q&A outside, but- Mosquitoes! We are getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, so. Ugh. But that ain't gonna stop us. The show must go on. So we will continue to A, your cues. Yeah, it's awfully runny to be oatmeal. It's not runny, it's Pretty sure thick. that's porridge. No, it's oatmeal and you put healthy things in is it. Porridge like just like, is porridge just like the British way to say oatmeal? All right, so one question. We already filmed our response yesterday, but we got it like four or five more times. So we're gonna yes. redo our answer. 
So the question was, how do you recommend starting a business or a woodworking business or whatever as a young person? So one person asked, I think they were like 19, one person was 20. If you didn't know, we made a whole video on this. Mm -hmm. It's called Tips for Teens Starting a Business. The video totally flopped. YouTube did not want to show it to anybody because most of our audience are older white older. males and they just didn't connect with it. So YouTube didn't, sh if, if it doesn't do well in our core audience, it's not gonna spread to the people that need to see it, so. Which makes us so sad because people have these questions and, and we answered them and we want them to see it so bad and we don't want YouTube, like we don't want YouTube to stand in between like the information that they need. Which is why it's so important that you subscribe and you hit the bell. We're not just saying that because we want our numbers to go up. Really, if you don't wanna miss content from us, you have to hit the bell because just because you're subscribed does not mean YouTube's gonna show you the video. Anyway, we have a video on that. It's called Five Tips for Teens Starting a Business or something like Five that. Five Sales Tips for Teens. We'll link it up here in the corner right now. So you should be able to go find it, watch it, and then come back here and finish watching yes. the video. That will help our numbers. <laughs> All right, Michael wants to know what comes after Samara? What are the long-term plans? Somebody realizes Somebody's... we got some big goals. Yes, some uh, goals. Yeah, so Samara is the business that will hopefully fund our other businesses. If it does well and it's successful, it will be the cash cow that we use to jump into other ventures. We've got a lot of ideas. We don't know what they're gonna look like exactly, which is right where you need to be <laughs> with super long-term goals. Uh, we want to build airplanes. We want to do something in education. We want to work with kids. We want to do music at some point. There's a lot of different fields that we want to, I don't know, go in and have some fun. So, but we're going to need a lot of money to play in those arenas. Yes. So that's why we started with Samara. And also Samara is teaching us how to run a business. If we want to be serial entrepreneurs and run multiple types of businesses, we need to be able to sell something as boring as furniture. I know or furniture- a cutting board. <laughs> right, if we can't figure out how to sell a commodity like furniture, then we're not good enough business people to try all the other things that we want to try. Not a question, just some feedback. You guys are doing great and very inspiring. Oh, cool. that was nice. Thank you. Thanks. That made my day. All right, Zach wants to know, will we ever give up flying through hurricanes to woodwork full time? I mean, honestly, it works out really well for us to fly part time and run the business. Full time. We are like we I don't feel like the hurricane hunting thing digs into our schedule too much. Right. And honestly, when we say part time, a lot of people think, oh, 20 hours per week. But it's I mean, it's less than that. We, we go hang out once a month and then two weeks during the summer and two weeks during the winter. Like that's so it. So it's, it's really like less than part time, which is amazing. It works out so well in our schedule. So we really don't have any reason in the near future to ever stop. Well, we have so much fun with it. And yeah. as soon as it quits being fun, maybe we'll have a different conversation. But the goal is not to quit that job so that we can continue woodworking. We see that job as sort of our community service to humanity. And then, uh, and we just enjoy is, it. Like yeah. it's just something, it's just another thing that we really, really enjoy. Skylands TV wants to know after you hit 100K, are you going to be dropping more than one video a week? Where have you been? <laughs> we've been posting two videos a week for a month, and now we've done two and a half weeks now of a video every single weekday. Come on, man. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. Dan the Maker Man wants to know what moment are you most proud of in terms of starting and operating your business? Honestly, for me, it was selling our first like bulk batch of cutting boards. I really like it when somebody comes to us wanting a big piece of furniture. When people say, oh my gosh, I've been thinking about this for yeah. so long, I want you to do it. That's the most proud moment for me. It's like, yes. So Bruce A. Ulrich asked us, why Houston? That is a very long story. <laughs> when we were getting off of, act I'll try to tell a fast version. When we were getting off active duty in the military, we're going from full-time to part-time reserves. I didn't think I was gonna get the reserve job. There was some medical BS that the Air Force never got around to doing and it, it was, anyway, it was a paperwork catastrophe. I'm sure a lot of you have got similar stories working with the VA and other stuff, but I didn't know I was gonna get the job. So we obviously knew that we were gonna make some money with the Air Force while we were transitioning to this new job. But if I didn't have that job, I wasn't going to be getting the paycheck to transition. And if I didn't have that job and that transition money, then we were gonna to need to depend on the woodworking business a lot sooner than we were expecting to. And so we thought, shoot, we need to be in a bigger city. We picked Houston because it was close enough to Mississippi, close enough to family, and was a big city that we could build and sell our furniture quickly if we really needed to. Because Fortunately, everything worked out, we got the jobs, it's all good. Yes. But we ended up landing in Houston just because of timing and- It's big and there's lots of money here. What spices of wood, I think he means species, 
of wood do you use for your cutting and charcuterie boards? <laughs> we, so species we use, we use cherry and maple. But as for spices... <laughs> a little bit of oregano. I like cinnamon. Winston Woodcrafts wants to know, what's the hardest thing you've had to overcome building your woodworking business? Oh my gosh. Um, I love this question. Thank you, by the way. Do you want to go first? You want me to go for it? Not being afraid of asking people for money or like using sales tactics that you know work, you're just kind of like uncomfortable using because you never had to use them. That's been the scariest part is literally just asking people for the amount of money that your stuff is is worth. But once you get over it, it's like, oh my gosh, all the freedom in the world has been unlocked to you. None of the scary parts of the business have ever been from the business. They've yes. all been they've all been fears that we have. Like the like business happens every single day. There's new businesses that start up. There's restaurants that open. There's like giant corporate mergers. Like business happens. It's not like it's this big mystery of you don't know what to do. It's it's all a problem of of you. And as soon as you take responsibility for that and say, you know what, I don't know what that is. I'm willing to look stupid up front so that I can learn and do it right on the back end. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I would say sales is the hardest thing for me too. Like from a young age, I would cry in restaurants as a kid because I didn't want to talk to the waiter or waitress at a restaurant. I was afraid to talk to the lifeguards at the swimming pool when I was a kid. Like, Weren't I, you a lifeguard? I was, eventually, yeah. <laughs> and then I realized how silly that was. Talking to people has been one of the hardest things like in my life to conquer. And credit to my mom for forcing me to do it anyway. Like, I'm so glad she never bailed me out because I just had to buck up and learn how to do it. Dan wants to know, Bruce, good boy or very good boy? Very good boy. Very good boy. He's dopey and kind of stupid sometimes but he's a very well-behaved good boy. Benjamin wants to know any tips, well, Benjamin and half of YouTube wants to know <laughs> any tips on buying wood? Where do you get the material for all your work? I'm so shocked at how often we get this question. Like, we normally don't answer it. So for anybody that's ever at wondered that question, that might even be the title of this video, go to Google, open up a new tab, and type in hardwood dealer. Now, be very careful. Don't look for a flooring hardwood dealer. Look for a lumber dealer. And you can usually tell by the description on Google or on their website what they are. But within an hour's drive or so of, of you, there is someone who sells hardwood lumber. That's your maple, your cherry, stuff like that. Robert wants to know, would you say you're entrepreneurs first or makers first? He's asking more like, where do you find the most fulfillment day to day? Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I've always been a maker from little RC airplanes as a kid to like just tinkering around, like losing my dad's tools all the time. <laughs> like I've always tinkered with stuff. So I guess I'd say I'm a maker first. Like entrepreneurship is sort of a learned thing for me, but also, yeah. I, I don't know. I was kind of raised to be an entrepreneur too, not on purpose. I don't know. I mean, I, I always grew up doing crafts. Like that was my thing. My parents could not get me to stop making like crafts around the house constantly. <laughs> So Mr. Craig wants to know, why don't we just sell the house we're in now, move to a rural area, and build a giant 40 by 80 climate controlled shop to run the business? One, I can't sell this house because the landlord would be very upset with me. <laughs> He'd be like, at least consult me first. That's called fraud. <laughs> That's called fraud. <laughs> but We anyway, couldn't write that one off. <laughs> no, probably not. Um, but also, after spending a lot of time running both businesses out of our house, we have discovered that we have bigger plans than what a home shop could ever do. Yeah. We are going to one day we are going to be in a 100,000 foot industrial warehouse with multiple assembly lines, hundreds of employees. Like that's where we see this going. There's no way a home shop could ever scratch that itch. I don't know how I edited this, but we've talked about this in this video about how like the eventual goal is to have Samara funding other ventures. Mm -hmm. That means we are not going to be woodworking day to day. Like, we love it, it's fun, but yeah. I don't wanna do it forever. But if, if everything goes well, we shouldn't be the ones that are like on the front lines, on the, you know, on the phone selling stuff or building stuff um, every single day. What's that? Cody oh. wants to know, is Eric gonna come back? I don't know. Eric, you tell me. Eric, are you coming back? We miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Super life-changing question. What song is at the end of your videos? That is Stick to the Plan by Jalen Ashan. It's also linked in the description of every single video. So go down there, click the link, make it happen. All right, we got to speed this up. We got to do some rapid fire here. Okay. 
How do you do balance between business work and personal? Uh, listen to the podcast. That's where most of that is. Yeah. Does Davis like Bucky shirts because he looks like them when he makes that face? <laughs> yes. Yes. What's your budget for the commercial space, like monthly rent? Uh, yeah, it's about that much. What's your favorite brand of tools? Um, whatever one works the best. We don't take tool sponsors for that reason. We just want to use the tool that works best. Where do you see yourselves in 12, 24, 36 months? I don't know. I feel like we already answered that. Well, this is bun. This is bun. This has been really fun. Yeah, thanks so much for all your questions, uh, both on Instagram and YouTube. Um, we had fun answering them. Some of these were really like, they're things we think about, like big picture in our own brains, but we don't get to talk about it a whole lot on the YouTube channel. So it was nice to be able to share some of that information with you Would guys. you like to do one of these again? Let us know down in the yeah. comments. Don't ask your question in the comments, but just let <laughs> us know if you want to do another one. We'll let you know. Follow us on Instagram or hit the bell to be notified yeah. for our videos. And uh, that's how you'll be notified when we do this again.